Final speaker for the day is Ian Thompson, who's going to talk about getting measurements to do something useful in cognitive psychology. Okay. We've, we've heard a lot about um, quantum measurements in this session and yesterday, and most of us think of it, the main function of quantum measurements is to make quantum physics a little bit more classical, which I think is a rather boring thing to do. So I'm, I'm going to propose something that can be useful um, for cognitive psychology. And if it's useful, it means we can test it and, and so on. And um, so this is, I'm going, to, I'm going to design what I call a quantum-like epistemic engine. Epistemic engine can be regarded in many ways. You can, if you're a materialist or a quantum physicist, you can think of this as a quantum computer stuck in some microtubule somewhere. Um, but if you, uh, if, you leave, if you believe in consciousness or dualism, then you can take the epistemic engine to be something like a sensory mind um, connected to the brain. And so this is a, a, a speculative theory proposal. I'm going to discuss the, the, the two um, issues. We've, we've talked a lot about um, the uh, quantum measurement problem, and I'm going to talk about how this is similar to the sensory recognition of external objects. Um, and I'm going to show what some of the simplistic solutions have been proposed for these. And, and I'm going to show that the, if we could have some ideal solutions, number three here, these two problems could be solved in a very similar way. And maybe you can use quantum measurements to solve the recognition problem. And then so I'm going to design in an ideal world what this quantum-like epistemic engine would do, how it would function. It's going, as a preview, I'm going to use joint quantum measurements between neurons in this thing, so that its quantum probabilities represent credences, so you can do Bayesian analysis. And, and then it's going to be rather slow to start with, so I'm going to make a proposal, a small amount of new physics, um, which would make a big difference to the performance. And so that if this, if this performance is what you want, and then this is a testable prediction. So we've seen a lot about quantum um, measurements um, in this, these sessions. The classical wave has effects everywhere. A quantum wave has effects at one place. And, and you can draw pictures like this. The previous speakers had their own pictures. And there's been a number of simple solutions proposed to make life more classical, the maximum distance, maximum energy difference, etc. cetera. Um, but the trouble is it's very difficult to detect these limits experimentally. And in fact, most experiments to measure these things discover that quantum physics does quite well. You, know, you never actually find these limits except um, by decoherence. But I want to connect this to the quantum, uh, sorry, to the sensory object recognition problem. So humans and animals recognize visible objects very quickly within a tenth of a second, 100 neural steps. So you can, the top row, you can recognize cars in any orientation, um, any distance, any background, but the bottom row is not cars. Um, and so how is this done? Well, if I look at you, I recognize people in here, I recognize chairs, a projector, all these things, just a quick glance, I, I recognize these, these things very quickly. And it seems amazing to do it. I mean, of course you can do it with modern computers if you have big GPUs and do a thousand million steps in a GPU on a gigahertz time scale. But this, our minds or our brains, whatever, don't seem to be doing it like that. Um, so I've jumped ahead a bit here. There are two kinds of proposals to do this measurement problem. You can do a progressive extraction of abstract properties, or you can do predictive coding, predictive um, processing mechanisms. But both of these, as I just said, require lots of neural computation. And if we could do something quicker using quantum physics or using a modified quantum physics, then we might have some new ideas that which could be tested. What I'm going to show next is that these green refers to quantum and blue refers to sensory observations. So we've got two kinds of observations. We've got quantum observations, which is the quantum measurements, and we've got sensory observations, which is observing a chair or some, some object. And, and maybe these, are, if they're similar, maybe that's an aspect, both aspects of a new kind of event with joint 
physical and epistemic effects. But there's what I call a probability gap. If you just use standard quantum physics, there's, there's a problem with speed. So let me summarize the similarities between ideal solutions to the quantum selection problem and to the sensory selection problem. Um, both of these problems have a, if there's an ideal solution that selects upon many alternatives that are already there, a quantum measurement selects among the different probabilistic options. And a sensory shape, if I'm going to recognize a chair, I select that, that particular shape among all the possible things that could be on the floor in front of me. It could be an elephant, I recognize that. Well, it's very rare and improbable, but there are many, very many things. And furthermore, both of these selections select alternatives between configuration spaces with very many dimensions. The entangled particles have three dimensions for each particle. So if you think of all the particles in the air or all the, um, there's a lot of dimensions and, and the, but quantum measurements apply in these multi-dimensional cases extremely quickly. Um, but and recognizable objects have also very many possible transformations. These chairs could be arranged in, a, in a, another way and I'd still recognize them as chairs. And if I move up close to them, I still recognize them as chairs. And both quantum measurements and sensory object recognitions appear to be quite fast in the sense that some outcome just pops into existence. Quantum, this quantum, if you have a quantum measurement as a projection operator, then it, it works quite quickly. I mean, it's the, the reduction of the wave packet um, gives just one grain of a film being exposed. The selection appears to go very quickly. And our sensory mind can also recognize objects, especially dangerous objects that have been selected evolutionarily for that. Now, I'm going to skip over this slide, but I just want to show that um, Bayesian analysis can be applied to describe both of these processes, or conversely, both of these processes can be regarded as implementations of Bayesian analysis. And Busemeyer's papers, he, there's a new paper he had out this year, one of the previous speakers talked to, showed that in, a, in, in one of the yesterday's talks. So both, both credences for observations given um, evidence of the, of the sensors um, can be written as a, as a, as a, in the Bayesian formula and quantum measurements, if you do a straight preparation and then do a second measurement to measure the hypothesis probabilities, you can show that also follows Bayesian rules. And I also want to show that um, quantum um, correlations can be um, built up in such a way that you can use a quantum system, a quantum state to describe the correlations between all the objects in the room, all the possible objects in the room and their appearances. So it's, as, as many speakers have said earlier, it's very easy to make entangled states in quantum physics. So I'm going to imagine making a, an, a, uh, an entangled state here, uh, a correlated sum of all the possible high hypotheses H for the, where the objects are and their, their appearances, the evidences that where they would appear. And so you, by doing, um, doing a measurement on, on this quantum state with the, with the, what the evidence that, that, you, that the eyes have before them, you can project onto that um, and then you end up with a distribution of the hypotheses. So this is a very quick way of getting information, well, actually, actually it's not very quick, but it's a way of getting information out of a, an entangled state and it's possible to set up in, in an ideal system and you know, an ideal epistemic engine, it's possible to set up these correlations in such a way that you can use it to recognize objects. But there's a problem that you end up with a factor of square root of n on the wave function, which is, means a probability factor of one over n, all these possibilities, it's actually rather, rather slow. 
but I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to try and see if I can use a, a system which has these quantum measurements, these two quantum measurements, um, and in such a way that I can make an epistemic engine like an analog quantum computer. It's not going to be a digital computer, it's going to be an analog quantum computer. And I'm going to use its wave functions to describe credences so we can use it in cognitive psychology and do all these, all the cognitive psychologists who show that the mind recognition processes seems to operate as if it were implementing Bayesian analysis. You can do that by using these quantum wave functions. And this quantum-like epistemic engine interacts with the neurons in the brain. And I, and I imagine following Chalmers and McQueen that the brain already has um, quantum measurements in it, which make um, qualia or sensory evidence to be these superposition resistant qualities. So the brain, the function of the brain in this system is to produce um, projections onto particular sets of qualia. So I imagine that the brain can, in my mind, in my head, sorry, produce the qualia of everything that I see in front of me. And, and, then, and then I want to use this, um, this measurement that, go, that goes on in the brain to connect to the sepistepic engine. So this epistemic engine, which is, you can think of it as a quantum computer somewhere in the world or somewhere, it has an initial state with a large number of stored contributions. And, and then you, you apply two measurements to this quantum computer or this quantum-like epistemic engine. You apply a measurement that the brain does um, for the particular information from the sensors. And I want this, this this, the, the brain measurement simultaneously applies to this um, quantum-like epistemic engine. So that the quantum measurement is a way of transmitting information from the neural system of the brain to this quantum computer. And then a second measurement on the quantum computer then selects um, what the objects are seen. So this is an extremely um, simple way of setting up a quantum computer, an analog quantum computer, to do object recognition. You set, up, set it up with all the correlations between objects and their possible views. And then you project onto the possible views um, from the, using information from the sensors. And then you do a second measurement and it picks up what the objects are. However, there's a problem in normal quantum physics. This is very slow because of this one over n factor. The, the, they're all all these measurements in this quant in this quantum computer are, are random. So you have to it, it randomly selects all, all the possible things and it goes through all of them and you have to repeat it many times until you find um, the object that uh, you see with your eyes. And so this is rather slow. But now I'm going to um, sorry, I, I missed out. I'm going to speculate, I'm going to make a proposal for a new way in which quantum measurements work. I'm going to say that there's a, a joint measurement between this, quant this quantum-like epistemic engine, this quantum computer, and neurons. So the probabilities, this is a joint measurement. So the, the, the quantum measurement applies to this quantum computer and the neurons simultaneously, and, but the probabilities are determined only by the, on the neuron side. So this is a way of transmitting information from the neurons to this quantum computer. Sensors determine sensations. Normal quantum theory, the probabilities are determined by both sides. So this is an asymmetric measurement. And, I'm, and the, the fact that this is not standard quantum theory anymore is why I use like the, 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 the quantum-like epistemic engine. So I'm trying to design a quantum computer which works in some space which we have to work out, which does object recognition very quickly. And it's coupled to the quantum system of the brain by these joint measurements. So this is rather speculative, I agree. But you could imagine if you go back 
to the standard quantum physics. This is something which could be done using these quantum computers we've seen pictures of earlier. But I'm going to say that if, if, if living organisms or um, conscious organisms um, could recognize objects very quickly, and they do seem to um, um, be able to recognize um, specific things in, in their field of view much quicker than a, a, we would expect from the neural, the neural speed in the brain. If, if, if we accept that that happens, then this could be one explanation for why we, we recognize objects. And so this means that this, the, this quantum light proposal, because I've changed the probability slightly in the joint measurement, I have to, I have to go back to what's called Gleason's theorem, which is what's used to derive the particular probabilities. But Gleason's theorem assumes that you just have one system you don't have two coupled quantum systems. So there's, a, there's a, a, a get out there. So because these, this quantum like proposal changes the probabilities relative to normal quantum physics. And if, if organisms did use something like this for sensory processing, then these different probabilities could be tested using information from sensory psychology. And in fact, sensory psychologists have been doing in tests and measurements on, on object recognition and sensory and oral um, recognition for the last 150 years or more. And so there's a lot of information which could, in, which is in need of, exp, um, not of information, which is in need of explanation. So normally physicists such as myself, my day job is a nuclear theory, um, do not change the basic probabilities, but, um, but since there's no particular fixed theory for quantum measurements, there's, it's still quantum physicists do not know exactly when um, quantum measurements occur. Although um, Kelvin and, and David's theory is an attempt to make a prediction for that. Bec um, so I, I feel that I have some cap capacity to um, change this principle for this particular case. Um, which would be very useful for living organisms if they had access to a, a quantum system like this to do object recognition. And so you can ask, where is this quantum engine? And it, it has to be connected to the brain and so that it has joint, the, the joint measurements affect both the brain and the system. And it has to be, a, it's, it has the same problems as quantum computers. You have to isolate them so it's an implementation problem. Um, so it could be within microtubules with the nerve cells, or it could be within the, um, what, what string theory calls extra dimensions or bulk space, or it could be in some kind of new mental space which hasn't been discovered. And so in that case, it would be like another plane or another conscious level of reality. So that you can, whether you're a, a materialist or a, a speculative physicist or someone who is even more adventurous. There are different ways of implementing this, but I think we can calculate this. This model can be formulated using quantum mechanical wave functions and we can uh, model what goes on and we can test the functionality. And then we can see whether um, where, where it could be. So to summary, summarize, I'm, I've proposed that somewhere connected to our brains is a, a quantum-like epistemic engine, a, a quantum computer which has the particular function of being an epistemic engine. Paul Churchland used the phrase epistemic engine in about 1979. And it has the features that it uses quantum mechanical probabilities to represent um, credences, which those of you in cognitive psychology and um, machine inferences will know about credences. And it uses a, a correlated initial state to store, to store all the ep epistemic correlations between objects and their appearances. And then it relies on the fact that neurons in the brain cause quantum measurements, perhaps as Kelvin and co have been proposal. But I'm now going to say that when measurements in the brain occur, then there's this new connection, this joint measurements between the brain and this 
new epistemic engine. And if that is possible, um, then we get this very fast selection of, of objects recogn recognized that we see when we look around. And that we do see objects very quickly when we look around. So this is, a, in some sense, a, a proposal for linking um, quantum observations with sensory observations and their recognition process. So it's, it's a speculative proposal. It uses, it builds on what some of us in the room have already been developing um, and, and, and as, a, as a solution to the quantum mechanical measurement problem. But now I want to go further and, and work on a, another level and see how a, a slightly modified um, version of quantum measurement could be very useful in, uh, in the sensory mind for, for cognitive recognition of objects. Thank you. Thanks for an interesting talk. Uh, I still don't understand why, for example, it takes about 200 milliseconds, if not mistaken, to, to expose to a face until you actually see it. Yes. And from what I understand, say research, recent research by Doris Tsao on face recognition, for example, shows that it's an extremely efficient system and, and it works exactly with feature detection, but you can, you have about 50 different Yes, but do you features, have Yeah. And it, it is enough because of con connection and scheme that to, to measure from something like 200 neurons to be able to predict which face the primate is looking at. I, 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 think I, it, the, the, I don't think there are any time problems that 200, if 200 milliseconds is, too, is not enough, I'm, I'm curious why. That's well, there's, there seems to be built in neuropsychology to recognize faces. A number of people in this meeting have talked about that. But I'm, I'm thinking about recognizing elephants or motor vehicles if they come into the room. That's extremely improbable events that we, know, we have no preparation for, but we would still recognize them. You know, so, and, and there's a scale invariance, which is a, a puzzle. When I move towards a chair, it doesn't change in size, even though it gets bigger in my eyes. There's lots of, there's lots of problems about speed and invariance um, in, in sensory recognition. It's not even clear how the brain does in scale invariance. Um, that's one of the puzzles. But there, there is some kind of linear decomposition of input, whatever. I mean, uh, machine learning people, they have these convolutional um, neural networks, but they're not real. There's no convolutional processes in the brain. Okay. I'm thinking about um, NACA cubes, that uh, sometimes you recognize it's coming out of the page, sometimes you recognize NACA cube going into the page. Yes. You can also force it. You can force yourself to see it one way or the other. Can you force uh, it? I, I, I have trouble forcing it. It's not easy, but I think it can be done. I, I yes. Do, so do. You, you, can just, you, can, you can change your priors. That's what the Beijing people would say. You can, you can bias your priors so you can you preferred to be one rather than another. I'm just wondering whether there's an analog there with a Henry Stapp style use of free will in quantum measurement, yes. where he thinks that you can uh, apply your free will to cause the uh, wave function to collapse in a certain way. Probably. So thinking about there's an analog yes. there between uh, quantum measurement and free will and yes. recognizing things in free will. It could well be. I'm super interested in this asymmetry yes. you're talking about. So is it, so it wasn't, you didn't define it really. And no, it means that the probability information goes from the brain to this quantum computer. It doesn't come back. You get, the, the information has to come back by a different route, such as I talked about last year. So, so it's sort of asymmetry in causality. Indeed. And so I'm just wondering if there could be an asymmetry, asymmetry in time in in if there's some kind of so that's almost a spatial asymmetry um combined this, this is a logic I, I haven't thought about asymmetry in time I, I i should well yes because i wonder if that can buy you i've always wondered about these um, sort of pop-out effects and these extremely fast sort of almost top down but not enough speed yes. not enough time to get a top down effect but exactly. it's still a top down effect this is a proposal if it, if it worked it would give very fast recognition Right, and so I'm wondering if you could get like a retrocausal speed up. I'm, I'd, I'd need some persuading. 
Sorry. <laughs> okay, so, and again, I'm, I want to kind of drop down a couple of, of levels of sophistication here because I want to understand your quantum level and you say epistemology, or what do you call it? it I know what epistemology is, but it's so epistem it, mean, mean just means knowledge. Right, Ep right. Epistemic engine is a knowledge. Epistemic, engine. yeah. Okay, so your epistemic <laughs> engine, that's a that's like a big black box for me. It's a right quantum now. computer that's yeah. coupled in a specific way to the brain, to the neurons in the brain. Right. And, and but what makes it experiential? Because you're talking about well, a chair okay. and a machine. A, I know. A, a computer you, can sense okay. it. Okay, now, now you get now you're getting to the interesting questions. Yes, yes. So that's 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 <laughs> okay. Why I well, see it you, first of all, you have to admit you have, your worldview has to admit that there are such things as experiences. And and you, this is this version is compatible with dualism. Well, a substance dualism. If you, if you want to, if you want substance dualism, something like this could be used to explain how the mind and and, and the and the brain interact with each other, in what, how how the brain transmits information to, to the mind. Because a, a a a classic computer with proper sensors can already yes detect a chair better than you probably and tell you but yeah but yet it requires very millions of steps to do right. so but but that still doesn't know the essence of what it is no so in, in order to explain where the, where the appearances come from you have to have a space in which or a place or something where there are experiences and so that my option of having a mental space would you would say that if if there are forms in this mental space then that is the visual um Phenomena. That's where the qualia is. You could you could take that view of my men, of the mental space option. Just a quick abstract question. I apologize. This is this is out of your field. Um, but I've been working on like knowledge management management types of activities. Yes. And one of the one of the problems that I'm dealing I deal with is like forming connections or indexes between like pieces like atoms of information. Yes. Um, and I was seeking out the possibility of potentially involving myself in like the getting like a quantum computer and practicing the different ways you have to connect things. Um, and I was wondering what you thought about the possibility of, of uh, when dealing with this, actually being able to gain intuition okay. that be useful. Yes, I have thought about it. Okay. Um, and in fact, the, my, my initial state, which stores correlations, can be regarded um, as, as a dictionary, anyone who's done. And, and, and this, this, this fast method with these asymmetric measurements can be regarded as a way of associative memory because a fast associative memory because normally on a computer associative memory you have to look through all the words in the dictionary or have a hash table or something whereas um, but psychologists have been saying that humans have associative memory they've been saying it for the last 50 or more years but they have no idea how to implement associative memory uh, and so the this, if if this if this quantum like epistemic engine could be set up like this, then it would be a very fast associative memory, and it would be a natural way of of using associative memory because you could use it for many other purposes. Every time you look at a word, you you have the meaning and so on. Um, but it requires this 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 biased probability to, to make the you don't want to have just a random selection over the whole dictionary. You want to you want the key to be known and then you want to use that probability of the keys to look up the results so it requires this specific kind of change the probabilities so a normal quantum computer wouldn't give you a, a fast lookup so just a quick follow-up do you think it could be useful for me to look at initial conditions while i'm trying to gather observation data on these notes um because i the Nicholas Luhmann was the man who made the Zettel costume, which was a bunch of boxes and index cards connected to each other. And he had sequences of chains of thought. 
and you just go through it from beginning to the end and associate it if, if, it's, if it's in there already or add it to the end if it wasn't. And you sort well, of organize his thought processes based on this, but he complained about an issue of this massive associative correlations between all of the different cards. <laughs> and I'm yes. trying to understand a feasible way to try to, or not even completely, but just a beginning approach to try to capture those correlations. And I'm wondering, is this well, initial condition type of information used? Well, a, a quantum system um, with entanglement can be used to store an enormous amount of information. And we've heard this claim many times, and, and then whether we're also said to be much easier than, than it used to be. So a, a quantum computer can be used to store lots of correlations as you know, between um, keys and, 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 the, and the, the text for, as in a dictionary. But the lookup process with normal quantum physics and a normal quantum computer is very slow because you have to you, you look up and you get one at random and you have to keep going until your, the key you want appears. <laughs> so although, so quantum computers themselves, I don't think are actually going to be very useful. Uh, that's because, because of this randomness approach and because they have decoherence and you have to repeat everything a thousand times in order to get some statistics out. So I have colleagues working on quantum computers. They are much more optimistic that they'll ever be useful than, than me. I don't think they're going to be useful. I, I looked into it about 20 years ago. But... Okay. Well, thank you for that. I'll definitely take a look yes. into this randomness yes. issue. So, okay. Thank you for the talk. Okay.